AMB Properties is Quincy's largest apartment rental company with hundreds of units available. They offer short term and long term rentals with one up to four bedroom apartments. AMB Properties meets the needs of its tenants with care, compassion, and a quality of service that exceeds expectations. AMB Properties also has a convenient tenant app for you to do your payments or make repair requests. Give them a call today, A and B Properties, 217-919-8080, Quincy. I have yeah, done this a few times. Tyler, just ask for a timeout when you get one. Appreciate that. What you do, you just say, uh, you just say, you know what, can we break for a, a potty break? <laughs> I'll just say, it's <clears> seamless. <throat> pineapple. Mm. Is pineapple the code word? <laughs> no, don't say that. Yeah, what's the safe word? Pineapple's a good <laughs> safe not, word. That's not a good safe word. No, no. Uh, yeah, so we'll um, I do at some point. So we're live, but who knows when Bob's going to pick it up and start going. You never know. But uh, is your phone on vibrate? It's uh, over by my child. Desi, is your dad's phone on vibrate? Yeah, it is. I got my watch anyway. It'll I know, I'm mostly just trying to make conversation with the child. <laughs> No, you put it on vibrate. <laughs> yeah. There we go. One thing about Desi is she understands electronics. I guess Doesn't so. she? she? Yeah, she does better. Yeah, the, she knows some, how to me use sometimes. Yeah, she knows how to use electronics. Yeah. You know, you know how to use the TV in my kids' room better than they do. Yeah, you chose all the movies. Like you ran the whole room. Yeah. But anyway, Tyler Tomlinson. Hi. 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 I <laughs> uh, just saw you at the coaches meeting at the Fuzzy Bubbler a couple nights ago. Yes, we had a good meeting. I've had good feedback. You did have um Yeah. You added yeah. a bunch of coaches. Yeah. Yeah, they added themselves, but yeah. Tyler Tomlinson, uh so my favorite title is a uh, head women's soccer coach at Culver Stockton. Um I know you Me too. Uh, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I know uh, obviously you're the director of Monarchy Football Club in Quincy. You've got about 150, 160 kids in that club. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, at the Bubbler, you put on a coaches meeting where we had you know 20, 25 of our coaches in there, and mm -hmm. you were schooling all of us on soccer theory. And I really appreciate that. Uh, not just giving ideas, just giving ideas so you can take in what you want and use what you want as a coach to be better. Yeah. That's what it's all about. What do you do when you're not at Culver? What do you do when you're not coaching soccer at Culver? I try to golf. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I teach at Culver. Um, and so this year I taught, um, man, probably 15, at least 15 credit hours uh, throughout the year of communication um, journalism classes. So that took up a lot of my time um, as well. So, yeah. Um, but when you're not doing that, you know, um, you're recruiting. Um, you're working on your budget. You're working on your inventory. You're working on retaining your kids that you have, uh, making sure their grades are doing well, they're being good citizens. Um, so those are definitely other things that would keep me busy. Yeah, so I noticed um, who is the – what's the name of the Culver Stockton men's – soccer coach also tyler tyler hamilton okay i met him at the mm -hmm. bubbler mm -hmm. he seems like a really awesome guy i was really happy to have him well yeah i'm 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 very biased uh towards him um he played at culver he was a communication major so i taught him uh he was my student and then he was a student intern for our soccer team and coached with our team for two years uh, while he was at the school, uh, then in his in his professional life, he sent me players uh, that he was coaching that ended up being members of my team as as college players when he was in high school, uh, coaching high school. Um, he married one of my former players. My goodness. So yeah, I would say that I know him pretty well. Yeah, and I noticed when I was looking around the room, you you keep really good company. I always wonder like how I'm there if you keep such good company. <laughs> 
<laughs> I wonder that too. Do yes. you? Yeah. 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 Uh, so does your uh, you are my, sister. You, you, you have become like um, th- my organized part of my brain. Yeah, you man, know, like, so, but you... I know, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, gosh, I... I, I'm organized enough to ask you to do things. See, see, how, okay. see, see what I mean? I'm like, man, okay. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Ooh, I bet if I ask Frank and then you're like, you need that done, it's done. And then like that's Correct. just your response to everything. And so eventually you become the organized side of my brain. If you text me or call me and say you need something done, I'm pretty much going to stop what I'm doing to do that. Because otherwise I'm, I have the illusion maybe. I give off the illusion that I'm more organized than I am. So what happens is if you say, Hey, can you do this one thing, this administrative thing? I'm like, uh, yeah, you got it. If I don't do it right now, oh, baby, <laughs> then you'll I have no idea when it's going to get done. <laughs> so, so that's why. I so see it it, somehow, some way we work well together. Yeah. So, uh, another reason why I might be like, you know, talked about maybe in your family or some people close to you is because sometimes I write things on Facebook and then your sister, uh, <laughs> Tiffany Tomlinson phrase, um, who's who's a, quite the badass and shark in her own tank over there? At you, well, you have to be you have to be careful because like my sister could write a post that says something like, uh, "Just drove through uh, this restaurant and got an iced tea," and it would get like thirty seven comments, two hundred and ninety four likes, and then and then I'll write something like, um, you know. Uh, I just bought a house and it'll get like 10 likes and like my mom would say she loves me. And so I, Tiffany has like this uh, face and, and it's you now you're, you're the dance mom social media presence is in probably a big one. Uh, yeah. So she has that following. She has a know, huge that, following. Yeah. So that, yeah. So when she, and you do too, right? So it's, it's not it's like the, that though. The Titans clash. Right, and, but you, she just says she's getting an iced tea. You stir up all, all everyone's feelings, and so then those iced yeah. tea and those feelings collide, and it's Facebook. Yes, she writes fireworks things that are uplifting and positive for humanity, and then I go in there and just ruin everything. <laughs> That's what I do. You bring us back down. I bring us back. <laughs> you guys, you guys it's like, a good, good balance in the not world. Not down to earth, <laughs> just, just down. down. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I wish I could say I'm sorry about that, but I'm just, I'm just kind of not sorry. But uh, that's okay. I mean, you know, I, you know, interpersonally, you know, there's like um, social media personalities, and then there's interpersonal personalities. Mm-hmm. Or if you're talking to somebody on the phone, have you ever talking? Have you ever spoken to a recruit, um, either on the phone or email, and you get one version of that person, but then when you see them in person, and you talk to them, it's different. Yeah, What's I actually that think like? that's more of an adult problem. Honestly, um, kid, I, I, I think when recruiting kids and, and working with college kids, just as adults are, they do try to present their best life uh, as kind of the, the number one goal, right? My best pictures, uh, uh, April dump, right? But then like it's artistic but cool pictures that everyone's jealous of. I think that adults are the ones that play two roles in their life because they've found that those kids have grown up with that, right? I think adults have found the freedom online to be someone different, right? Um, And so I I would say it's more of a problem with people our age. I could tell you way more people our age that are different online than they are in person versus my kids that that I work with, coach, recruit, et cetera. I think it's more of an adult thing. Interesting. Were you born in Quincy? I was. Born and raised? I was. So uh, before this pod, I was asking Bob earlier in the day if he could find um, that that last second shot that you made for <laughs> yeah. the Blue Devils. Mm-hmm. And so I I looked for it. I couldn't find it. And he said something that's just gonna be it's just gonna be one of those things that's hard to find. Do you have that video? Can we talk about it for a second? I I do. Uh, Desi and I actually we were looking for the original copy video DVD recently. We we couldn't find it. Um, we do have like a digital, like satirical uh, version of it that popped up through my WGEM days. Uh, so so we do. It does exist. It, it's out there. What did you do at WGEM? Uh, I was a sports reporter, weekend anchor. Wow. Bob was my boss. He hired me. Oh, you didn't tell me that. You didn't ask. That's true. <laughs> I didn't ask. Okay. Wow. What did, 
isn't life kind of amazing? Isn't it fun? Are well, you having fun in your life? Uh, I am. I am. And I think uh, one of the things that you said is probably really true about me is like, I, if you're good to me, like I will keep you close. Right. And yeah. so like Bob and I, we still have a really good relationship, right? He was good to me. He gave me an opportunity. Um, and then I was, I'm forever grateful for that, but uh, I want to keep in touch with him because of that, you know? And so I think, yeah. And, and, and just if <laughs> hiring coaches, just knowing people and trying to keep them close. I think that's an important attribute. I'm a loyal person. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that is something that's important, especially in a community like Quincy. Right. One of the things that kind of shocked me about our meeting a couple nights ago at the Fuzzy Bubbler, I, first of all, I like the fact that you, when you choose your meeting places, you choose like these intimate places like the Bubbler. And then you got like the owner, John Hanchett, who is like, says, all right, you guys want pizzas? Do you guys want cheese? Do, do you want beers? And like, and, and you're, and you're such a good host. I'm shocked at the quality of the people that you keep around you. I mean, it shocked me. I, I expect it from you, but a couple nights ago when I'm sitting around the room, you know, at that monarchy meeting and looking at the quality of the people, you hold such um, high quality people in, in, in camp with you. I mean, even like, you know, I remember you and I talking a while back. It's like, okay, for soccer trials. So I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to make this all about soccer, but it's this idea of you run a club on top of being married and having, you know, Desi, you know, and that's, all of that's a lot of work and, and your regular day job and all of the, the extracurriculars and you're friends with everybody, like everybody, so many people know you. And then I go in and a few weeks ago, we were talking about you're bringing on two brand new teams into the club. Okay. And as you're bringing in, as your club expands and gets better, more powerful, and it's amazing to watch kind of how you do that. Cause I sit back and you let me in on a lot of different things, but to watch you operate inside the club is incredible. And I wish I could be like Wendy Arnett and see the other <laughs> side of you because she gets to see like the Culver Stockton part, but you bring in, so you brought in Tyler mm -hmm. Hamilton to coach the 2016 boys. He's going to coach the oldest team. Oh, he's going to coach Actually, the oldest team. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? 2011. Oh, he is? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. That, um, is it? Eddie. Eddie Garcia mm -hmm. is going to teach, the, is going to coach the 2016 boys. Mm -hmm. And then you brought in two coaches for 2016 girls. Who are those? Mm -hmm. uh, Grace and Sophie Shackleton. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that the way that they carry themselves and the way that all of these people that you bring in, I'm sitting there and I'm, just, I, I'm congratulations on making <laughs> such good decisions on personnel. Well, people have to say yes to you. <laughs> that's a that's a big part of things and in, in, in today's world it's it's hard right like we we have trouble i'm like man we're adding all of these new restaurants who's gonna work there <laughs> right like what well, and who so who's gonna work there right, right i'm like yeah all right oh 10 new restaurants great oh god like who's gonna work there well if someone works there then who's not working at these other places yeah right and okay. so to get people so we're i'm lucky Right? I'm lucky that people want to help us and give their time to Quincy's youth. Right? That's a, it's a big responsibility, probably a responsibility not a lot of people want any part of. So I think that we should be grateful. I think that any uh, organization, um, whether it be club or park district or the YMCA, that people want to give their time to help. Like that's, that's, In today's day and age, once again, that's a really – uh, good thing that's happening and the fact that we can have all of these things in Quincy um, and have these great people help us right and help our kids I mean I think we're we're lucky in that sense right because it's not always like that and it's tough and you know I I look at things like referee shortages mm. right and how do we have enough referees I don't know still like I don't know how we have enough referees and so Locally, we don't have a ton for, for sports, all, all different kinds of sports. Um, and so, like, I'm always overly uh, cognizant of how referees are treated because I know we need them, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, I, when I got to Culver, it was like the, 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 the coaches before me didn't have great relationships with the officials. But, like, it was in a time when that was okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, like, how long ago? Uh, like like 15 years ago okay you know it was it was okay it, there could be some strife 
And um, the men's coach at the time, his name was Blake Ordell. Um, and, and, and he and I were like, well, first of all, it's not us. We don't, we don't want to have strife and, and conflict with people that we have to interact with all the time. And so we both agreed, let's change that. When referees come to our school and our games, let's welcome them. Let's, let's, what can we do for you? Thank you for, for your time. We appreciate you officiating the game. Let, we can have candid conversations during the game still, but then after the game, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, whoever. We appreciate you know, you, you, your work today. Let's change it. Right, and I think that um, we really did. I think we really did. I think there's a lot of officials that they come to Culver now and they enjoy being there. But I think we, it, t- it takes an effort to do something like that. When you were in college, did you know that you're going to be coaching soccer at Culver and running an entire youth soccer club? No, no, no. I was going to be on ESPN. Uh, yeah, that that's where I was going to be. Yeah. So what were you studying? Uh, journalism. I, I got a master's degree. See, I, I was smart, right? I got a master's degree just in case I sucked and didn't make it to ESPN. And that happened pretty quickly. So uh, what's it, your master's? It, it was it was in mass communication. Okay. You know, most of my research there was in like communication law, actually. <laughs> so yeah. How did you I, I don't one thing that and I how did you go from hitting that last second shot as a blue devil in basketball with my eyes closed probably <laughs> how did you go from that to a soccer coach at culver how how does it go and, and you played soccer at senior high as well i didn't yeah um yeah i wasn't a great basketball player i was i set a lot of screens you know i made jd summers look really good um i got him a lot of i got him open quite a bit uh, and then I just played defense. Right? I knew my role. I was really good at my role. Right? Coaches probably liked me. I didn't really play till then. Like I, I wasn't. I didn't. I don't think I started on my seventh grade team. I didn't start on my eighth grade team. I might have started on my ninth grade team because other kids moved up. Don't think I started on my sophomores team. And then I started every game my senior year. So like once again, for the development of kids. I just stuck it out and did everything I was supposed to do as a player, right? So just there's a lesson in and of itself, right? But, uh, but I was a better soccer player. I went to Culver uh, on a soccer scholarship. Bill Schneider uh, recruited me. Uh, I did talk to the basketball coach. This, you'll like this conversation. Uh, Steve Hill. Um, and he said, um, so are you, if you come here, are you going to also play soccer? And I said, yeah, soccer's my better sport. And he said, yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, I'll tell you what. If you didn't play soccer and you just played basketball, I think you'd be really good for this team. Okay, oh. but, but, but playing both, you, you're not going to be good enough. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. You know, so thank you for meeting with me. I'm just going to play soccer. Uh, and so that, so that was it. So I, I went and I played four years there. I got my degree. I went to Central Missouri right after. I got my degree there. Then I came back and worked uh, at KHQA. Uh, as my first job, uh, I interned there. Uh, Carol Sowers uh, kind of roped me into that. Um, I was a bureau reporter in Keokuk, uh, so that was kind of my beat. And then it ended up being like, "That's your beat," but then like, "Can you also go all over Missouri and Illinois?" So I, they said I had a beat, but I didn't. I covered everything. And then Bob, like, he wasted no time. Uh, I was at KHQA. This is not great. By the way, I was there six weeks, <laughs> and then I left. Uh, luckily, I didn't sign some crazy contract or anything. I left to be my news reporter job to be a sports uh, weekend anchor at at uh, at NBC WGEM, uh, and I did the radio show with Josh Houchins, um, and that was probably one of my my most fun memories uh, from from there. Uh, but then I'm starting to look for jobs right outside of Quincy and get out of there uh, in the TV market, and um, ended up realizing. I was started to adjunct at Culver. Just they called me and said, "You have a master's. Can you come teach a night class once a week?" Sure. And then I realized like applying for teaching jobs was way easier than like you know getting your reel together and sending it you know in in, in proper mail form uh, to all these TV stations. This was before everything was electronically. Uh, you just didn't have a YouTube thing. It was sent out. It was way it was way more difficult to you know do the work back then. And so. Um, yeah, I had I had some other interviews at some other schools, um, and then Culver ended up hiring me to teach. 
not coach. I actually was a teacher at Culver first. You were a teacher first. Okay. Yeah. So I did one year um, just teaching. And then um, Greg McVeigh, who was the athletic director there, I had helped with basketball while I was there. Um, my buddy was the women's coach at Culver. So I was just helping him out. So I met everyone in the athletic department and then they fired both coaches for soccer. And so he approached me and said, how about you just do this? And the options were, you know, get your PhD, which costs a lot of money and a lot of time, a lot of studying, a lot of work, or you just go into coaching. And so I chose the coaching. And I thought at the time, based on the scholarship structures, et cetera, the women's team probably had an opportunity to be more successful. I'd say that's probably the right decision looking back. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought soccer was soccer, so I didn't really care. And I just wanted to say like, hey, where can I thrive? And so, yeah, went for it and that was, I'm in my, I'll be my 14th season in the fall. Wow. What, what do you do when, how do you unlock the brains of, of the college students who come to Culver and play for you? What do you do? What do you say? What kind of culture are you trying to foster mm. there? Yeah, I think a welcoming one, I think is, is really important in, in today's society with like college kids. I think that's really important. Um, it took a lot of groundwork and discipline to, and, and patience over years to create a culture that is what I would almost call like self-sustaining, right? I don't feel like I work super hard anymore and inject all of this energy into like what my culture is going to be for the team. I think that the players carry it on really well uh, themselves and they kind of set standards and, you know, on our team, I don't have to say anything, on our team, like we do our study table hours, on our team on time means early. Our team, you know, we're respectful. We get good grades. We do these things. Um, and so ultimately, like, we have good enough leaders and kids that they're, that's passing on from class to class with, within the players. So you, are you saying that, are you saying that like some like, like the, the, uh, the older players on the team, are they, when they see freshmen coming in or transfers, are they just showing them the ropes? I mean, is this, you start the ball rolling, it just keeps, keeps going? Yeah, I, I, really, I, I really do think like we're, we kind of have like, a, a, as I said, a self-sustaining culture. And it's not just like showing them the ropes. That is important, right? But it's also like welcoming them, wanting to be a friend uh, and a teammate, you know, um, you know, being outside of your class and, and talking to someone else that's in another class and seeing how their day is going and seeing if they want to do something. Like those extra steps, I think, help and matter. Um, and sometimes you have to talk about those things to, to get them going. Um, but I, at the beginning, it wasn't easy. You know, I was probably disciplining a lot more. I was probably a lot harder. And, and you know how the coach, you, you know how players are like, well, when I played coach, you were way harder on us than you are now. Oh, yeah. Well, well, part it, of that's societal, right? But I think part of it is if you're there a long time, it, it starts to take care of itself eventually, I think was what I've noticed. Okay. Like if I went to a different team, I probably would have a lot of starting over to do. Um, but at the beginning, yeah, I, I was hard on the kids. I disciplined a lot. Um, I made sure that we were meeting the standards that I thought we should be meeting as a team. You discipline less now? Oh, way less. Yeah. And because less. you don't need to? I really don't need to. Like I... We've probably had like two or three um, discipline disciplinary issues like uh, drinking or d making a bad decision. Honestly, like two or three in like the last three years. What uh, are some What are some former players that think maybe you're going a little <laughs> too easy? Or, or should oh, you I, I I could call a couple of kids right now that would would say that I'm really soft now. Yeah, and really? like, you just you just weren't like that with us. You know? Okay, interesting. Um, and, and when I reflect, they're probably right. Uh, but, like, you, you, you kind of can't be anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a, you know, there's a line that you just you have to be careful not to cross in, in today's coaching world. Yes. Um, and so having the knowledge of understanding that line is important and, 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 and understanding that you have to move when the line moves too, right? And yeah. there's always going to have parents that are be like, I respect the old school coach. Right. But sometimes they, they do up until their kids affected by the old school coach. Mm -hmm. And then they might change their mind on their perspective because, you know, <laughs> little Johnny well, comes home and he's, he's butthurt, you know, like, I think you, yeah, you and I have talked about that in the past where I think I've said something like, man, so-and-so we really need to, 
fix that situation. Good thing this isn't wrestling. <laughs> that 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 kid would be running. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just a, it's such an interesting dynamic. Um, you remember dynamic. we we sent an email to our parents because our kids were nine, but they weren't paying attention, and we made them run. Mm. And we thought there's there's going to be some parents that are like, why is my kid running? And so you and I got together and we said, <clears throat> let's get ahead of this. Let's t- let's say, hey, look, this is. We think it, it's going to help the focus if we just throw it out. And we've never done it since. We haven't done it. We actually haven't needed to. But do you see what I mean? Like we set the standard. Interesting. And then we included the parents. So the parents might have said something to their kids too. Like, hey, like you don't want to go to soccer practice and just run. Would you start listening to your coaches? And it might have just been a one sentence conversation at dinner because we communicated that with the parents and we held the players to a standard that now we're, we, didn't have to, we, haven't, we didn't do it the rest of the season. Right. right. So uh, it's not as hard as we think it is sometimes to kind of create those cultures that the direction that you want to go. Um, you know, I think there's a difference in coaching the genders too, right? Like I always listen to Coach Hamilton and the men's team and the, the guys are always coming in and, you know, like, you got to be harder on us and push us more and discipline us. And like, you know, you should, you should yell at us more. You know, and they're, they're always, they always think that they want those things. Who says that? The players. Oh yeah, they they think that, all the you know, players, a lot of the players on the men's side, men's side. Yep. Oh, and, and so, you know, and, and it is fascinating because they a lot of player, a lot of, first of all, players that think they need to be uh, pushed really hard and yelled at typically are the ones that don't respond well to that. Is what I've realized. <laughs> they don't. They think they do, but they actually don't. Like they they change as they are as a player. They think it's helping them, but it's actually making them play poorly or or worse. Okay. Um, and my thing, and, I, and I, was, I was talking to Coach about it, and I said, here's what I've realized. If you're always yelling at them, how is something that you say going to be more important or carry more weight? It, it can't because you're always angry. You're always yelling. You're always disciplining. Hmm. I said, for me, I'm always pretty relaxed, and I try to be even keel as much as I can. Um, so then if I'm upset, and if I yell at my team, you know, my college kids, um, or I say a bad word, right, it's going to carry a lot more weight because coach doesn't usually behave like that. Why? We must really have messed up because now he's behaving differently than he usually does. Okay. Right? So there's, if, if I'm always at 10, what's, what, there's no 11. I can't ever draw importance to something because I'm always at 10, right? If I'm at, if I'm at four all the time, I only have to go to like a seven to get – them to realize i'm serious like we is really it kind of like up. remember back i was gonna say remember back in the 80s <laughs> i do when, when you had when we had parents and maybe there's still parents like that i really hope i'm one of these parents but i don't know it's like um where if you when you're parenting kids coaching kids and you just set a standard immediately and then they just know like anytime there's they're, they're getting out of line you're just kind of not cracking the whip in a harsh negative way it's just you just almost have a zero tolerance for Mm -hmm. anything they have to stay in line Mm -hmm. and then later on as you kind of let go a little bit and let them kind of be themselves when they get the look (laughs) they just correct yeah so i don't know what it was like with you growing up i'm not sure how you were parented i know that my my parents it got to a point i do remember i i do remember getting spanked a couple times and every time it was Looking back, I did deserve it. Like one time mm-hmm. it was, um, I, I was a, a real small kid and I just did not care about looking both ways before crossing a busy street. <laughs> Shocker. I just, yeah, I just, I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm going. I'm going. I, my ball went over there. And I remember one of my parents said, if you do that again with, without paying attention, you're gonna get one mm-hmm. shot, mm-hmm. you know? You're and not gonna like it. You're not gonna like it. It's not gonna feel good. And you have to, cause they're trying to, wire my brain yeah. and so i remember one time my ball goes across the road and i start to look and my dad just gave me a look and i'm like okay oh oh, oh yeah, yeah both oh ways, look both well because he's trying to save my life <laughs> right he doesn't i mean <laughs> yeah. you know he selfishly probably didn't want to go to the hospital right right but also like he he's probably, like i'm well, we're gonna see how this experiment plays out here <laughs> he probably cared <laughs> about me too but uh, what do you think about uh i have this theory 
and I don't know if this is there. So there's sexism and reverse sexism, but re re really re reverse sexism is just sexism. I have this theory that girls are more coachable than boys sometimes, and particularly at early ages. And I don't know if that's true. And I don't know if, like, I've noticed, this is my own personal experience, and I don't know if I'm way off on this, but I've got, I, I've seen a situation where you've got, let's say, eight-year-old boys, eight-year-old girls, and three out of three times in the same type of age group, the boys, they're not listening as much as the girls. Now, and I'm not trying to, you know, I, I, I have a son, I'm not trying to rag on him, but my girls tend to be, my, uh, my kids that I coach um, just tend to listen more than, than the, the girls tend to listen more than the boys sometimes. And I don't, and this, is this a gross overgeneralization? Um, I, I have had college coaches, and I have a lot of connections <clears throat> that have coached both genders tell me that it can be more rewarding to coach the female gender because their response and application and coachability is so much higher. Um, and not always in a good way, right? You're, you, what you're deciding how they're going to play, like they're going to go play it really, you know, and that's how they play. So the boys will take more liberties and freedoms and, um, and maybe that's a good thing too in development, um, you know, but I, from what people have told me, like it's just a little bit more rewarding because you, you feel like what you're coaching is being done more. So yeah, like to, to, to generalize the two genders, I, th I think that it's pretty accurate, yeah. Well, that's kind of a, you know, if I really extrapolate that, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to think too hard about it, but let's say you've got two equal talent pools, okay? And, you know, in, in a vacuum, which, by the way, is impossible. You, you can't get mm. two sample sets that are perfectly, quote, unquote, equal in terms of the talent pool. It's just not going to work out that way. And that's not a gender thing. That's just a statistical mm -hmm. impossibility. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. But if you did have something like that, I would almost rather, I mean, even though growing up, I mean, I played boy soccer. Okay, mm -hmm. I've never played girl soccer. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, this idea that um, back when I was, when I was a kid, girl sports were, was not where it is today. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad and really happy to see the evolution and the growth of that. That makes me really happy. I mean, I've got three kids, two of them are female. So, I mean, the amount of energy I put into those girls mm -hmm. is, is monumental. But I just think that you can have more success, generally speaking, and any of the super, super pro boy people out there may give me some pushback on that, but I just feel, feel like you can have more of a feel good success. And maybe it's just in my head. And that's what I said. I, I told the coaches, like, yeah, like it, it doesn't mean that team's better than the other team, right? Like the boys could have way more talent, but just because your imprint is if seeing, you can see the imprint better with the girls, you makes you feel better as a coach. I don't know. It, 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 what's, what's the better of the two? I don't know. How know? much effort did your parents put into you as a kid, into sports, academics, I, I emotional was, support, everything? I mean, I, I was uh, one of those, uh, if, you, if you do this, you're doing it full out, right? And so every practice. You, you said this? Or I your, know, my parents. Your parents. My parents like um, me quitting baseball was like, it was, it was a discussion. Like it was not a, like, hey, one day I came home and this is it. And they were like, okay. Like that didn't, it didn't In happen. In the middle of the way. season? No, no, I, of course, never that. Like, I had to finish everything. That, that wouldn't happen. So, like, just quitting the sport was a big deal. How old were you? And I didn't. My, I decided going into high school, I finally at that time, I, I wasn't going to play three sports. <laughs> this is crazy to even think that, right? And, and th even then it was like, okay, like, so, but you've put so much time into baseball. How did it, how did it break down? You think, you're thinking that you're not going to play this third sport. Mm -hmm. You're going into high school. Yeah. You're going to senior high, right? Or to junior yeah, high? Senior where, high. Senior high. Was that back when senior high was? Well, I, I was I was at the junior high, but I would yeah I would be on the freshman base or G, JV baseball team. So what's happening? You're thinking in your head. I wasn't enjoying it. And then what did you sit your parents down? Did you say something at dinner? What what happened? I think so. Something very simple, like yeah, I just we need to talk about baseball. I'm not sure I want to play anymore. And then it was like, well, you know, you've put so much time into this. We've put so much into this. You know, you've gotten better. This and that. 
<clears throat> and I, yeah, I have. So it, it really wasn't easy. And I'll tell you, it got worse because, um, and I, I thank my parents till the end of time, right? Because I did quit baseball and I tried to quit basketball, right? Going you into did. my junior year, right? I tried to quit because one, all my friends quit. Okay. All the, all my soccer player boys, except for like one, they all quit. Right. So I was like, you know, they're all quitting. Like uh, some of them are better than me at basketball. Like, why am I still on the team? And then, um, that sit down conversation was a lot different with my family. Right. Cause it was like, and, and they gave me some perspective, like, look, they all think they're not going to play either. And they, they're probably right. Some of them, the team that you're on is really good. Like they're really good. And you spent a long time. Th- it, 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 you should just write it out because I think you're going to reflect and say like, that was probably the right decision. We think you put so much time in it. You're going to probably play next year more as a senior. You just have to get there. Well, now looking back, that was, we went into state. We got third place. When did you hit that shot? I, that was a senior year. Junior year, I didn't play much. I, I was just part of the team. But that team now, no team has gotten that far ever since for Quincy High, right? Third place in state. That was a big deal. Um, and so re- I'm in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, like all this stuff. And you wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been. And my you parents said, just said, like, just did this you have, is the right thing. Did, did, did you have one parent or the other make more of an impact on you when having that discussion was that was a that was a collective front versus tyler wow that wasn't like mom said maybe we should let him quit no it was a collective front this isn't a good idea we think you should see this through amazing and i was ready to bail and like looking back what a that was like what a fun year that was right what an experience to to do the things that we did and and people still talk about the games that we won uh, and the players that are on that team and how good they were um, but people that know you in Quincy, a lot of people, the reason why I'm talking about the shot heard around the world when you made that last second shot, and I, and I, I, I don't even know what game it was. What, what, what game was it? It was a pointless game. It was an in-conference game against Moline. It had, no, it had no weight to it other than just like that's the, the environment you know, palpitating in this gym of fights okay. and all this stuff well, happening. I, uh, so people talk about it, though. It, it's it's I'm not saying people talk about it every single day. You know, like when I go to Chicago, I was sitting at this bar one one time at Dublin's in the middle of Good downtown bar. Chicago. Do you, do you know where that is? Yeah. On Rush Street? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was sitting there. I like Dublin's. And I was um, waiting tables at Carmine's yeah. across the street. Yeah, I know Carmine's. Do you? Yeah, <laughs> so love Carmine's. The triangle, the, the Viga triangle. And um, I was sitting there and someone goes, uh, oh, you're from Quincy? Do you know the Douglases? <laughs> yeah. I'm like... <laughs> Actually, I don't, but I want to because you're, you know, and then all of a sudden we started talking about Quincy basketball and I acted like I knew what they were talking about. That was just before my time. Like I did not know. But yeah, this like, is like people know me and Quincy like, oh, he was a Quincy basketball player. Like, oh yeah, you played basketball in high school, right? Like, yeah, sure. Like that was like my other thing, right? Like, uh, but it's, it, Quincy basketball is so popular. It holds so much weight. It's such it's a big a, deal. It's such a big deal. Um, it's a privilege, um, you know. One of my greatest memories of all time is just like the day I got my parka that had like my name on the back that only the basketball team got the parkas. You know, like my mom was taking pictures of it because she was so excited. Mm-hmm. You know, you made the varsity team. <clears throat> and so, you know, those those memories to me. And that, yeah, it's funny. Like you go anywhere, it's like Quincy basketball. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a soccer coach now. But sure, yeah, I was a basketball player. Well, it's just neat because Quincy is, I mean, Quincy is a sports town. You know, and it's, and it's when you cruise from different places and you cruise into Quincy and you go up and down Main Street, which is, you know, right here, and you go from Clad Adams, you've got the two bridges, and you go down Main Street, and you've got downtown Quincy, and then you kind of move into 12th, 14th, all the way to 24th. You've got the mansions on both sides mm-hmm. of the street, and it's the old, people say it's the old German Catholic mm-hmm. historic city on a bluff where there's a bar and church on every corner, which, by the way, that is not true anymore. We, uh, not as much. Not no. not as much. We had but, some fires. <laughs> we had some fires and some tornadoes. <laughs> but what do you think? Did you ever hear that how Quincy is um, strangely protected? Have you ever heard about this? I was watching the news uh, the past couple, two or three days, and I'm, I'm hearing things about these solar flares yeah. that are coming around and like yeah. the Aurora Borealis is 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 all over the place and i am totally ignorant to this there's this 
when I moved to Quincy, I heard that since Quincy is on um, a shock absorbing layer of limestone, because mm-hmm. you know, like the underground warehouses, and they're they're mining calcium carbonate mm-hmm. limestone for you know, and then sending it to James Huber, and they're making mm-hmm. and and they're and they're taking their limestone and turning it into tums, mm-hmm. you know, in antacids, mm-hmm. and it's such a neat Quincy is the gem city, mm-hmm. but this idea that Quincy is this this strange gem city where there's this urban legends of the last time the New Madrid Fault went, mm-hmm. that earthquake down there mm-hmm. in southern Missouri, yeah. the Mississippi River flowed backwards for days, mm-hmm. but nothing really in Quincy got messed up. Mm-hmm. But all of the homes like uh, on around, that side yeah, yeah. got demolished. Or sometimes there's this urban legend in Quincy that sometimes tornadoes will come to Mississippi, jump, and land in Liberty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know if that's true or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it it is it is funny to hear those things. Uh, it kind of it, it, you know, but it is a nice river town. Like, there's not a lot, right, up and down. There's not a ton of great river towns, right, right. that that take care of themselves and, right. and pride themselves on 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 how things are supposed to look and and things like that. And I think Quincy always has. And so, like, yeah, the Gym City, like, is is that way for another reason, right? Is because you they, the people that live here care about the town. They don't want it to to go to can I cuss on this? Yeah. They don't want it to, they don't want it to go to shit. Right. Um, and so I think that that's another reason why it's a, it's a great place to, to live, you know, for, for the, the caring aspect. I, I kind of feel like Quincy's an Island. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> it kind of is. but, it, but it's, I don't know if Quincy is the largest small town that I've ever been in or a part of, or if it's the smallest big town I've ever been been in it's strange like arts quincy is one of the oldest arts boards in the country it's we've got john wood we've got quincy university i mean culver stockton i'm sorry i feel like canton is a part of quincy i feel like it is in the greater like mm-hmm. metropolitan area mm-hmm. culver i know it's in canton missouri i know that but to me to me culver stockton is at definitely it you'd be definitely, surprised you'd be surprised how many people just like have never driven through the campus Right and talk about the school or yeah I know, I know a lot of people that go there or work there or just, you know have been there etc but they themselves have never like driven through and then when they finally do they're like oh my god like this is this is the campus like this is really nice yeah you know and I'm like yeah what's you know? the what what's the nickname for Culver that I hear sometime? the hill the hill okay the great late John Tripp called it the Harvard on the hill. You know, so it's shocking. How is Culver in Canton, Missouri? How, how did? Why is it there? Do you, do you have any idea? Like, oh boy. I, I mean, w- without getting into the history, this is what I've heard. Well, we're the I've first heard, coeducational college west of the Mississippi, as far as like both genders. Well, the first, that. pretty positive. Wow. Mm-hmm. And um, we, were fu- we were founded in 1853. Oh, I did not know that. So it's pretty old. Yeah. Okay, I did not know it was that old. Yeah. Like, I thought it was like 70 years later yeah. than that. Yeah. And what an interesting place. So I have driven through there once. It is gorgeous. It's beautiful. It kind of feels like when you first go into Canton, like, that's not what Culver. Like, when you drive through downtown Can- Canton, I mean, I'm calling it downtown Canton. There, there's a nice Mexican restaurant there. <laughs> there is. There is a nice Mexican restaurant. they don't Mexican have 17, restaurant. like Quincy does, <laughs> but they've got one. They have one good one. That's all you need. <laughs> that's all you need. It's one good one. And um, whenever I go in there, um, I order a very specific thing that only they have, supposedly. The, the, uh, the great uh, Gilberto Romero uh, introduced me to, to it. But when you go to Culver, it is a beautiful campus. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that all of the graduates from Culver have this certain je ne sais quoi. They have a certain kind of feel to them. They're grounded. They are traditional and respectful to like almost everybody. You know, not, let me rephrase. They are tr- they are respectful to everybody that I can see. I said almost because I don't want to be absolutist. I, I have no <laughs> idea if they re- if they respect their great aunt or not. But everyone is so nice. I've got somebody who um, works with me, and she's a Cooper Stockton grad, and she's on the alumni board now. Mm-hmm. And everybody that I come into contact with at Culver, there's a certain kind of a feel. It's just a really uplifting, good. And how when when you started working at Culver. The reason why I'm, 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 I'm pounding these Culver questions is because I'm trying to learn about this because I think it's really interesting. I mean, I know what I know about the other um, colleges and universities in Quincy, but I don't know enough about Culver. And it's, and it's a place where 
I would love for my kids to go to keep them close and I know they're safe mm -hmm. and I know they're getting yeah. a good education and I know, you know, um, it's not a huge city where there's a lot of stuff going on in the news right now, Ty yeah. Tyler, yeah. about universities where, yes, there is. you know, yeah. And what is it about when, when you first started working there mm -hmm. and associating yourself there, did you notice anything different about the people? Is there? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there is like a down home welcoming, uh, approach to it. You know, it's not, a uh, am too good for you or standoffish or elitist or anything like that. It's very, it's very open, very welcoming. Now, some of that, you know, may be rooted in like the disciples of Christ denomination as their affiliation, which is a very, everyone's welcome to worship with us. Open doors come in. We, we accept all people, um, kind of background to the college in general. Um, but then I think, you know, as, as times change and, and, and students start to look at different experiences, like, um, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of colleges that have a lot of commuters. They live in their parents' house, not getting the same experience when you live with mom and dad, right? There's a lot of kids that live in an apartment and go to college. Once again, you may not be getting the same experience when you live off campus in your apartment. You're getting a grown up experience, not necessarily a college experience. And so for our school, we, we require all of our kids to live on campus. So that's huge. Um, there may be a school way bigger than us but only like 300 kids live on campus, mm. right? So we have like a thousand kids that live on campus. So immediately you're getting like an authentic college experience. So you wanna like feel like Culver kids have like a different attitude when they leave the school. They're probably a little bit more cultured because they've had to talk to a lot of different people. They had to make friends with a lot of different groups. They're around these people all the time. Um, they're involved, they're immersed into uh, human communication mm. um, and not just when there's a party but like they're always there, you know what I mean? So I think that that culture aspect, what I've noticed is, is different. I sell that, I sell the hell out of that for recruiting. Like, do you want an authentic college experience? Like we'll provide that. Like there's always something going on at the school, right? Because everyone is there, that's where they live. That's where they interact. Everything's happening there. They're not off campus. They're not in apartments, they're not at home. So what's the general enrollment at Culver? About a thousand. A thousand and so, man, they all live on campus. That's amazing. And how many uh, general sports are there? I mean... Like 20 sports, maybe 22. That seems like, like a lot. It is. It is. It's normal, I think, uh, in today's okay. landscape. But it, it, it's an enrollment-driven institution, and athletics helps definitely draw the enrollment and drive the enrollment. So probably, like, if I'm teaching a class, 60% of the kids are going to be athletes, you know, different sports. And so that's pretty common. Uh, last question. What, what, what are you doing this summer? So you've got monarchy tryouts, June 12th and 13th. And then what are you doing the rest of the summer? Yeah. Uh, for, first thing, my family's, uh, we go to Siesta Key like every year. Where's that? So, uh, right by Sarasota, Florida. Oh, yep. And so uh, that's, uh, that's coming up for my family. So that, that's uh, kind of an important thing for us. So we always stay at the same place, you know, same, same restaurants and, and it's a, it's been a good family tradition. So Desi been there? Desi is a, yeah, she, she's, they have a, so Monday nights at like a six o'clock, I think they do a drum circle on the beach. So like such a hippie thing. Anybody can come and bring a drum or, you know, some sort of percussion instrument. And then the circle just gets bigger and people keep drumming. And then people start getting inside the dance, uh, the drum circle and they dance. Really? Right. Yep. And so. Desi, uh, she she loves the drum circle. She'll you know some people will let her play the drums, their drums, and then she'll dance a little bit. And what does Jessica think about it? She loves it. She thinks it's the coolest thing, uh, the drum circle. So that's that's been something that we do every year. That's definitely specific to Siesta Key. Uh, but yeah, we'll I'll do some traveling. I'll do some recruiting. Um, I got a, a few other places that I'm gonna gonna go outside of here, like New York and Colorado. And do you have to do recruiting during the summer? Uh, oh yeah. Yep. You have to, that never turns off. Uh, we'll have like an ID camp, uh, where kids come to Culver. Uh, so yeah, I'll be, I'll definitely be busy. So one little known fact about you is that you, uh, you keep track of all the beers that you try. I do. I do. And does Jessica, your wife do that as well? Um, she Not has the app, but she's really bad at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so she was the one who was kind of telling me that like, she's kind of like long untapped, beers or untapped is the app. Untapped. Untapped. So there's an app that you can just go to the app store. It's actually pretty. It's actually pretty popular. Okay. You know, like you can go 
to restaurants and it'll some of them like you just go to untapped and see their beer list right they just a qr code that goes to the app and that's how you see what you want to drink uh, so they're 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 out there they're pretty popular how many beers from quincy brewing company have you had oh boy uh and they're on there actually for those of you that like to have a beer in quincy um but i don't know probably 20 you've had 20 beers from quincy brewing company? probably yeah oh my gosh that's more than their menu yeah well but no. you know they change things well, well their catalog is like is huge well they had like but the belgian what was it the belgian triple that was like the new one this past week and uh, right. i was really excited about it um and it it delivered it was really good did it yeah but the fuzzy bubbler had this it was called like juicy vibacious or something like that and um it it was by great lakes brewing company and it was like one of the best beers i've had in i'm, an, I'm gonna say three years maybe what yeah it was like an ipa it's on tap right now and juicy the and yeah there's this like orange flavor of orange i don't know if, if you don't like orange you won't like it like an orange peel hint to it that was just super good Wow, really good. I'll try it. Tyler Tomlinson, thank you so much thank you, for sir. coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Love Thanks. It. You're a star. See you soon.